Hello, and welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I am your host this week, Brian Broom, joined by Greg Uttinger. And today we will be discussing, well, more, more in the same kind of general thread as the last couple of episodes, but specifically discussing King Uzziah. So, Greg, why don't you start us off? All right. This is a story that uh, familiar to a lot of people, but maybe not to all. It appears briefly in Kings, but more in a more expanded form in Chronicles. What has happened is that things hadn't go- gone so well in Judah, and the, for a while they were really without a functioning king. But when Israel to the north had been kind of lording it over them, got theirs from Assyria. Judah reasserted itself. They put a young man named Uzziah on the throne when he was 16. Chronicles calls him Uzziah, Uzziah. Kings calls him Azariah. So he had both names. Now, there's probably a reason that the chronicler uh, picks Uzziah because we're going to run into another Azariah before we're done. Anyway, Uzziah had done really, really well. He had um, rebuilt, restored, uh, he sought after God through his prophets. He defeated the Philistines, um, other tribes round about. The Ammonites brought him gifts. He was into creative building. He built towers in Jerusalem, built wells in the wilderness. He was a, a husbandman. He loved shepherding and um, and farming and did all he could to promote that and expand it even into territories that had been wilderness. He uh, organized uh, a small uh, professional army, strike force to protect uh, Jerusalem, uh, built weapons. And then w- one of my favorite things here, he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows and great stones withal. We don't have a lot of information from secular history as to when Palestai and catapults actually came into existence. I don't know if this was original with Uzziah, but it was certainly original, as far as we can tell, with uh, with uh, Judah, with God's people. They were getting into some fancy high-tech stuff here. And so far, God was blessing it, and everybody knew that Uzziah was, was a godly king. He knew he was a godly king. God really liked him. So, you know... When, when God really likes you, there are things that you can do that other people can't do, right? Yeah, sure. Um, hmm. He decided when his heart was lifted up to go into the temple, into the holy place, and offer incense. And for once, the priests and Levites were on top of this. Eighty of them got in the way, withstood him, and remember that the, the Levites particularly, but the priests who could be armed, uh, they were supposed to protect the, the temple area from sacrilege, from transgressors. And this could include doing some di- uh, dicing and slicing if necessary. So they were there in, in a group telling Isaiah, uh, no, this is what uh, the high priest, whose name is Azariah, says. Uh, it appertaineth not unto thee, Isaiah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Now, Isaiah was king. He was in the line of David. He was, uh, in that sense, by covenant, and an adopted son of God. The temple, or the king's palace, stood right next to the temple, so that the kings could oversee the temple to some degree and make sure people didn't mess with it and encourage its reform. The, the, the kings of the line of David had more responsibilities and more privileges than Saul had had, or the kings of the north ever had. But this was a no-no. This was a very big no-no. He was not anointed to enter the temple proper or to perform any of the priestly tasks. He thought in his... Um, in his spiritual pride, that he was the exception that he could do this because he's the king. And Azariah and the Levites, there were 80 altogether, withstood him. Now, you, th- you might think with 80 uh, old guys staring you down with swords at the belts, <laughs> and um, you might begin to think, maybe maybe I should rethink this, but no. And, and pride, spiritual pride especially, will sometimes do this to us. Uzziah was wroth. 
and had a sensor in his hand to burn incense. So he's 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 ticked off. He's very upset with the priest. How dare they? Don't they know who he is? I mean, he's he's already apparently in the holy place. I'm, I came all the way here. <laughs> yes. I came all the way here and I got this incense. I got this fire from outside. It's the right incense. It's the right fire. The right place. It's the right God. What's the big deal here? Get out of my way. I got stuff to do here. And yet, while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. God smites him with leprosy. Now, the high priest bore on the mitre on his head the words holiness unto the Lord. It distinguished him and marked him and his whole person and ministry as being set apart to God and to his service. It was his right and purpose, by God's grace, to be there. But now they look at Uzziah and they see leprosy in his forehead, uncleanness, something that not only means he can't be an officiating priest, even if he were a Levite, he can't be in the tabernacle or the temple. Mm. He can't be in Jerusalem. He's become a total outcast. God does not appreciate his will worship, his uh, belief that what he pleases to do, however close in many respects it might be, is good enough when he is violating God's word. Well, it's also quite fitting that it it's something that happens, it's put onto his forehead first, isn't it? Right. Yeah, exactly. It appears in his forehead as a counter to uh, the high priest. Um, there's a word for the thing he wears on his crown. It's not the ephod, is it? No, the ephod's the uh, the thing that comes over his coat that has all yeah, the jewels right. and contains the uh, the urim and the thummim. Said, uh, I think you said it before, mitre. Yeah, it's mitre, but the, the mitre is the is the the turban like affair. Oh, got it. And then. Yeah. Anyway, there's a golden plate there. So we all we all know what we're talking about, right? <laughs> anyway, Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him, and behold, he was leprous in the forehead. Now, that's just not a note of, hey, look at that guy. The priests were the ones who were to diagnose leprosy. And when in um, uh, Leviticus, where the original instructions for diagnosis are given, the language is very similar. You shall, you, the priest, shall look upon the man and here are the things you look for. So we got 80 experts on what leprosy looks like. Mm. And as one, they all confirm that's leprosy. And so, and it's in the holy place. So even though God put it on him, uh, that means he should not be here. So they begin to hustle him out and he somehow realizes what has happened. It may be that they all at once said, <gasps> leprosy, but at some, somehow he's, he's got it figured out and he decides he doesn't want to be there either. Uh, and it says, Yea, himself hasted also to go out because the Lord had smitten him. And Uzziah king, the king was a leper unto the day of its death and dwelt in a several house, a separated house, being a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord, Jotham his son, took his place, who, by the way, was a godly king. Uh, so we're talking here about the relationship of two covenant institutions, two things that God himself has established now, particularly in Israel, but there are broader applications. Uh, people will often look at the Old Testament and say, well, in, in Israel, church and state were the same thing. No, not really. As they, we can were, see right here. they were significantly intertwined in a, a certain sense of the term, but they were very much not the same entity. Yeah, they were not the same thing. Here, the king is basically trying to give orders in the temple. And not only do the priests stand up to him and say, no way. God himself intervenes to make very clear, yeah, this is a distinct sphere of responsibility and authority. You may be the king. You are the king. You're a king I've blessed greatly. You've done a lot of good stuff. But, but now is, you were the king. <laughs> yeah, now you were the king because this is not a thing you may do. Yeah. So at, at this point, I think we, we, we kind of look at the whole Old Testament economy and, and see some important distinctions. You may remember, of course, that Saul had done something similar mm. uh, when he was supposed to wait for Samuel, a priest and prophet, to come and offer sacrifice. He got antsy because the Philistines were coming and his own people were deserting, and he offered a sacrifice. And then Samuel shows up and 
Saul makes excuses, and Samuel says, "No, this is it. This it, he doesn't specify the rule that's been broken, but it's pretty clear that Saul should not have been offering the sacrifices. Doesn't say mm -hmm. why. Just no, that's not it. And this helps us. This passage here helps us understand why. According to the commandment of no duh. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, your kings don't do this. That now kings can can ask it to be done." They can stand by there. They can, while it's being done, they can pay for the sacrifice. They can call for it to happen. But the actual work of ministering this sacrament was a priestly thing. Mm. And uh, it's true of the sacrifice. It's true of the incense altar. And of course, it would completely be true of going through the veil and standing before the Ark of the Covenant. So God had ordained the Davidic kingly line, made Tremendous promises to it, given it responsibilities that included some things, as I said before, that weren't necessarily the responsibility of all kings in all time. But there was there was a limit. There was, if you will, in modern language, a, a wall of separation with regard to function, with regard to particular responsibilities, not with regard to the God they serve. They serve the same God, king and priest. Uh, and they both were to know the law of God. The king, in fact, was required by the law to write out a copy of the law in his own hand and to read from it day by day throughout um, his reign as king. But there were some things that the king couldn't do. And of course, by the same token, there was a lot the priests couldn't do. Priests did not collect taxes, although they collected tithes. But they didn't send a Levite with a sword to your door if you didn't pay your tithe. Uh, the king could force compliance to taxation. Priests in general did not enforce civil penalties, with some particular exceptions. Uh, back in the days of the judges, if the priest was like Eli, was also acting as a judge, then things got a little confusing. But as you read through the Old Testament and the histories, particularly, you begin it begins to become clear. The kings and priests don't do the same thing. And when they try, God isn't happy about it. Um, and so when, when people look at, at Christianity that talks about a godly society or honoring Christ in all of culture or something like that, they get antsy and say, you want the church to control everything. Actually, no, uh, we don't. <laughs> Where the church as an institution, one, is not competent, two, it's barely competent to do its own affairs at the beginning of the 21st century. But that's not what that's not what we're talking about. And uh, the church has its job description. It's supposed to administer, preach the word, administer the sacraments, maintain church discipline, assemble its people on the Lord's day to worship, uh, evangelize the nations, and keep on calling all sorts of people, commoner and king alike, to hear the word of the Lord and to do what it says. But the the sanctions that it would it would use to enforce this are its prayers against unbelief and disobedience. And if uh, the person disobeying happens to be a church member, admonition, rebuke, and possibly excommunication. The church is not to run through the streets killing people because they're idolaters or some other moral, guilty of some other moral perversion. When we look at the, the state in the Old Testament, yeah, there were a couple things it could do that we would probably feel uncomfortable with. If you raised an idol in the center of the city, that to to any god, even Yahweh, the the state was supposed to do something. We see kings leading revivals and smashing idols. Same thing would go for public sacrifice. But you know what? That's about it. As you look at the Old Testament laws, even the law of Moses, there's nothing about asking people if they believe in Yahweh. Uh, if they come to synagogue, if they come to temple, that just wasn't a job description for the state. You know, it was it, there is no point where even under the old covenant, even the Davidic kings were ever supposed to say, "Are you a true believer in Jehovah? We must punish you if you are not, or we must just expel you from the land, or some such thing." It wasn't what people believed, what they held in their conscience was simply not the state's business. In that sense, it was an incredibly free society. Uh, if you were a pagan, you could hide that in your heart, and nobody would probably ask you about it beyond maybe ca casual conversation as they try to win you to the fear of the Lord. 
nobody you can is even good. even hide it in your home. Yeah, because search warrants are a thing. If you didn't have two or three witnesses to the same overt act, then the state's not going to come breaking down your door and saying, we're looking for idols. Got any? That would be a gross violation of a law. And so there are a number of things that, as long as you kept them out of sight, they're not okay with God, but they're simply not functionally the business of the state unless you get public witnesses to an overt act. What you believe, what you say, for instance, if you were a Satan worshiper in Israel, that in itself, to, to stand up and say, hey, I worship Satan, might get you a visit from your pastor or the village um, synagogue leader, but that's about it. It's not a crime. People might be concerned about your soul, but that's not saying you're a Satan worshiper is not a crime. Now, if you uh, take your firstborn child into the public square, build an altar and sacrifice him to Satan, that would be a violation of all kinds of laws and the state would, would be involved. Uh, and, 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 and so it, it's very hard at the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st century, to talk to people who assume that the state has total control over everything, to talk to them and say, well, the, the state should be bound by God's law. That means you want the state to absolutely control uh, everything and make force everyone to be a Christian and act like a Christian and, and kill them if they don't. No, no. Hearts. That's, what, what was the old phrase? Uh, winning, winning hearts and minds and... They, they're they afraid that we're going to take American foreign policy and turn it into a religious policy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and no matter how hard you say, no, that's not it. Uh, the, the civil government in Israel was, in many respects, extremely libertarian. It, it wasn't supposed to be doing much of anything. And the only time it did is when it was an apostasy. Uh, now, the king was allowed to be a, a, a really good businessman on his own. Uh, and often the kings made a lot of money on their own, but they weren't supposed to squeeze it out of their citizens. Beyond that, they were supposed to enforce the laws, that is, catch criminals, punish criminals who had violated uh, laws by overt acts, not thoughts, intents, adopted philosophies. They had to actually do something, and there had to be two or three witnesses or the equivalent in uh, circumstantial evidence. And then they were supposed to defend the land from invasion. That's about it. So if you're not being invaded, and if crime is low, the the magistrates, the judges are pretty much sitting around playing chess or something because they don't have that much to do, nor do they need a great deal of money to not do much. You could have a fairly inexpensive civil government. Uh, it would be not libertarian in the sense that there are some things that Israel did not permit. But even those, I mean, honestly, today, do we see people raising huge statues to Baal in Times Square? It's I mean, there are a handful of places that have built uh, statues to Satan, but... <laughs> <laughs> not It's not the kind of thing you see. It's not super common, no, but it has happened. It has happened. And there are in other countries where the gospel is not reached. You can you can see lots of idols, but you know that's the kind of law that the Israel's government, both civil and religious, was to enforce was a law for a people who had who already believed in Yahweh, who supposedly knew the fear of the Lord. And there was no instructions to go into the Philistine cities and execute everyone who had been an idolater, because you don't get many converts that way. The uh, overwhelming emphasis of the New Testament is um, they got idols? That means they need Jesus. Go preach Jesus. And then they themselves will throw their idols to the mats and bowls. You don't, the civil government doesn't need to be busy with that. So this this is the broad, the broad strokes, a broad pattern. Is it possible to have a covenanted society under God that is relatively free? And, and even the answer of the Old Testament, let alone of the New, is yeah. It, it, it actually is. It's, it's healthy. It's strong. It's free. Uh, and again, we, we've brushed on libertarianism before. This it is, in many respects, very close to how most libertarians would, would look at this. Now, there are issues regarding sexuality and regarding religion where we would 
have to talk out differences. But as far as economics and government intrusion and government regulations, they really didn't exist in Israel. Uh, the assumption was that God's people were supposed to be self-governed. They were to fear God, know the law of God, have it in their hearts, teach it to their children. And when that happened, the civil government becomes not the savior that fixes a wrecked society, but simply the backstop for the few things that get through that are so outrageous, they have to be dealt with in a very public and decisive manner. So at this point, since we're, we, we've talked a little bit about, uh, well, how... How, how would this work in America? Well, first of all, America needs to, be, needs to be converted. America needs to come to Christ. Does that mean we can't have some laws that are in harmony with Scripture even now? We, no, we have quite a few of them, actually. Don't murder would be one. <laughs> the, the few laws that remaining that still favor marriage over against breaking up a marriage, and they are increasingly few, are, are there. Crimes mm -hmm. against perjury, that's something the Bible's in favor of. You should not perjure yourself in court. Um, theft, the Bible says you shouldn't steal from people. So there, there's already a lot that's there. And the thing is that most people in America give at least some kind of nod to it for whatever reasons. And as we look at uh, the controversy on abortion, most Christians are fine with saying, the Bible's clear on this, you should not kill a baby in the womb. And not every American agrees with that. And yet, that does, well, they don't agree. We should just be quiet. No. That's no, not this, how that this, works. No, this is important. And, and so, this, but this becomes an area of wisdom. Which things do you push on? And which things do you say, until America knows Christ better, this one, the church needs to straighten out it for herself, but this is not something we need to make a big deal of yet. And that's... And that this is a matter of studying Christian ethics. God told Israel what to do. Israel was covenanted. Israel was redeemed. We look at America, the American colonies were covenanted. The American states originally uh, reinforced this idea. But America today is an apostate nation. And simply stepping in with a gun and trying to tell people, trust in Jesus or I'll shoot you, is ridiculous. And contrary to the gospel, absolutely. I want to keep saying that because anytime you start talking about Christian ethics in America, someone's going to not hear you. And I listened to this podcast. You know what they were saying? They were saying you should force everybody to do this and this and this. Like, <laughs> no. But having said this, yeah, oh, you said but. Yeah, I did. Okay. I mentioned the 13 colonies. When the colonies were founded, there was a sense, an overriding sense, of their Christian mission here in the New World. Now, was it all sincere? Probably not. We're really good at saying religious stuff we don't necessarily mean or don't completely understand. And yet, they said it. Virginia's charter, the uh, king says to the people who are going to settle Virginia, we greatly commending and graciously accepting of their desires for the furtherance of so noble a work, which may by the providence of almighty God hereafter tend to the glory of his divine majesty in propagating the Christian religion to such people as yet live in darkness and miserable ignorance of the true knowledge and worship of God. Dot, dot, dot. Now, the king who said that was King James, and he was not the most holy spiritual king ever to sit on the throne of England by a long shot. Mm. But at least publicly, he was telling the people who were going to settle Virginia, our public reason is that you propagate the Christian religion to basically the aboriginal people. But I was taught, the people I was taught to call American Indians, we now call Native Americans or whatever the proper term is these days. Uh, people who first, didn't know who, First Nations, I think, for, yeah. is the new one. First Nations. I don't, whatever they want to be called, it's fine with me. I, don't, I, I always believe that people should be called what they want to be called, uh, as long as it's not a flat out lie. But, um, <laughs> uh, but here is King of England saying out loud in a public record this colony, one of its functions is to spread the gospel to these people there. Did they do it? Not very well. Oh, I but, mean, some people did, sure. Like, yeah. um, well, Pocahontas oh, came to Christ. 
well, now that I'm trying to think of the guy's name, I can't remember it. He wrote the first uh, Bible in a local Indian language. He, he, uh, John Elliott? Sounds right. Was he Virginia or was he Massachusetts? Anyway, and that brings us to the next one, the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut. Connecticut was a branch off of uh, Massachusetts Bay, and their, the we would call it a constitution they wrote for themselves, spoke of the importance of the maintenance and preservation of the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess, and also the discipline of the churches, which according to the truth of the gospel is now practiced among us. So one of the purposes, the founders of Connecticut said, uh, for, for separating from Massachusetts and establishing this new Puritan colony was to maintain and preserve the liberty and purity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Did they do it perfectly? Oh, I'm not an expert on Connecticut's um, local history. But as far as I know, there was they were very serious about this with regard to the churches. Uh, and, and, and you can run through what we have of the charters of the other colonies and find very similar things. Now, when the revolution came and we made our break with England, and the churches were no longer under the authority of the Church of England, even by some indirect claim, um, the colonies uh, either, uh, well, the colonies, as they established themselves as states, began to come up with their own constitutions and their own bylaws. And here's a couple of examples. Uh, anyone serving in the state of Delaware was required to make this profession, I, fill in the name, to profess faith in God the Father and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God, blessed forevermore. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. That's kind of explicit, but, you know, there are loopholes there. A Mormon could claim that, although there, was, there were no Mormons at the time. Uh, a good Aryan could claim that. <laughs> um, but you to to hold office, you had to make something that at least sounded vaguely Trinitarian, and you had to acknowledge both the Old and New Testaments to be given by divine inspiration. In no Vermont, Marcionites. sorry, no Marcionites allowed. No Marcionites allowed. Um, in Vermont, each member of the House of Representatives was required was required to subscribe to this declaration. I do believe in one God, the Creator and Governor of the universe, the Rewarder of the good and Punisher of the wicked. And I do acknowledge the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration and own and profess the Protestant religion. Protestant. That's pretty wide. It basically means you're not Roman Catholic or Greek Orthodox, but you claim to be a Christian of some sort. Um, and so there was no favoring of one denomination over, I think it could be Baptist or Methodist or Quaker or, or whatever. You could have your own little house religion, for that matter, as long as you called yourself a non-Roman Catholic Christian. As you uh, no, hear, North uh, the Constitution of North Carolina, no person shall deny the being of God or the truth of the Protestant religion or the divine authority of the Old and New Testaments or who shall hold religious principles incompatible with the freedom and safety of the state shall be capable of holding any officer, place of trust or profit, in the civil department within the state. See, they realized that religion can be your get out of jail free card if if you can say. Well, but my religion requires this of me. There are cases where, okay, that's, that's well. Uh, my religion requires me to sacrifice my firstborn child in public. No, that's not, but my religion that's, does. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, they're, they're in, in making this statement, North Carolina was saying, in effect, we're going to be very uh, generous uh, in how we interpret Christianity. But there's going to be some absolutes. And if your version of Christianity uh, allows you to wage war against the civil government or civil society, that's an invalid interpretation of Christianity. So, you know, the, the people that we know are fine, but if you come in and you think you have divine revelations and you can lead a, a jihad against the existing government, no. There are limits to freedom of religion. And yet, by and large, freedom of religion. And and you can go on and look at the other states. Some some are clearer, some are not. Rhode Island was pretty much of uh, nah, the state should absolutely do nothing along these lines. Georgia's was not very strong. 
the things that come that seem to come up the most in in what I've read of them is God and very often the triune God, uh, the Bible, and sometimes the Christian or Protestant interpretation thereof. And interestingly enough, the last judgment. Oh. And in for a civil society, the reasoning was really simple. If you do not believe that someday you're going to have to stand before the living God and answer for how you conducted your office and whether or not you kept your oath, then how can we trust you? That does make sense. And um, for the same reason, a lot of people were not allowed to give evidence in court because they couldn't swear an oath before Almighty God. And if you can't, then in life and death issues, wh why, why should we take your evidence into account when we already know you're not reckoning with reality properly? Now, you can argue back and forth on that as to to what degree you should listen anyway and all that, but it shows the mind of that generation. They're making a break from the Church of England. They're the ones who are going to agree to the amendment that says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And yet they realize that Christianity had something to do with the founding of the colonies, with the preservation of the states even after the revolution, and that this new federal government thing that they were creating shouldn't mess with the status quo. And, and that, that's true to the American spirit and American vision. Uh, the civil government shouldn't come along and force you to be a Christian or force you to say or do Christian-y things like go to church. And yet there is an absolute moral code in the background that is derived largely, if not entirely, from Scripture. And uh, they felt no need to justify that. It was The Bible says it, and therefore these things are right and these things are wrong. And it, this has nothing to do with the church telling the state what to do or the state telling the church what to do, which actually was a far greater threat than the original colonists felt, because so many of them fled from Europe and from England and Scotland, because there, the state was telling them how to worship. It wasn't the church telling the state what to do, it was the state telling the church what to do. And that's why the First Amendment was there. The First Amendment was not written by um, free thinkers and uh, deists and uh, rationalists primarily, it was written largely by Baptists and people like that, who did not trust the federal government one bit and were afraid that when they got this new overall arching government, that it would do what overarching governments always do, assume a specific religion and then enforce it. Mm. And so they they said, we'll, we'll, we'll support this thing of yours, but what we the freedom we have is the freedom we want to keep. And so no state church, no state telling you how to worship or when not to worship or how you can't worship, but the freedom to worship with the assumption that, every, yes, religion meant Christianity. And everyone knew more or less what that meant. And they knew more or less things like murder is wrong, theft is wrong, marriage is good, adultery should not be allowed to break it up. You should not blaspheme the name of God or the name of Jesus. You should show respect for the church and its worship and things like that. And you know what? Our founding fathers didn't become a bunch of religious slaves or idiots because they took on that perspective. Okay, so uh, we're going to move on to recommendations now. Uh, my recommendation this week is um, from my favorite living, still writing historian, uh, Tom Holland. He's not Spider-Man Tom Holland. Um, <laughs> he's, a, he's a British guy. Another British Tom Holland, as a matter of fact. And um, he's written... One of my favorite books on Roman history called Rubicon. That was my first introduction introduction to him. I have recommended his podcast to mem listeners of our podcast before. Mm -hmm. The rest is history. But <laughs> the book I read this week, which I will be recommending, is called Persian Fire. Ooh. And it is about the... Well, ostensibly, it's about Xerxes' attempted invasion of Greece. But because he is a good historian, he spends a lot of time, he, I think he starts about 150 years before Xerxes shows up. And that's only when he's getting to like the, the relatively major players. He actually starts even earlier than that at first, discussing the origins first of Babylon and then of Persia itself. Ooh, that sounds um, fun. It's very good. He, when I first read Rubicon, 
you happened to be in the room one of the days I was reading it because uh, we were at, a, I, I think we were at Austin's house. Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah. I, 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 I think I, I don't know where I was in the book, but I, I like read something and I closed the book and I looked at you and I said, you remember how in high school you said every historian should take a creative writing class? <laughs> this guy listened to you and he didn't even know you. <laughs> So he he's very good at writing and and at actually like writing prose. I noticed a a, a sort of you know if it was spoken you would call it a tick, but yeah. it's a it's a, a writing pattern that he does. Every end of a chapter he would he would give this lead up and it would be like super dramatic of like oh the forces were marshalling on the outer edges of the border <laughs> and doing X Y Z and then it would be a paragraph break and like one sentence like the forces of Persia were marching to war. <laughs> I noticed it like four chapters in in succession with each other, <laughs> but um, he's very very excellent. So um, it's very good. And and one of the things too is that he he does kind of point out, you know, we talk a lot about you know Sparta and Athens. These were the the heroes of personal liberty against an encroaching world empire that wanted to conquer them and crush them into the dirt. They they weren't so hot themselves. <laughs> they had slaves. They were monstrous warmongers, even the Athenians. Um, yeah. So, like, he he kind of puts that at the start, and then he goes on to talk about all, all this history stuff that they have done, like the the events and whatnot. But at the start, he's like, they're they're not great. Like, no one comes out of this looking great. <laughs> <laughs> Which, as usual, I think is a really good approach to history, especially if you're coming at it from a Christian worldview, a Christian mindset of, of ethics, like no one outside of Christian history really is up to muster on ethics. And even those within Christian history yeah, don't always yeah. come up to muster. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, it's always nice to like, at least have somebody acknowledge it and be like, Hey, these, this didn't work out so well in hindsight. Uh, Persian fire, Tom Holland. That is my recommendation. Why is it called Persian fire? We know what Greek fire is, but that's much I later. I imagine it's, a reference to um, something in Persian religion that he talked about. He oh, didn't, okay, yes. He didn't. He didn't tie it directly. He didn't like make an exact statement that I can recall. But um, the the Persians, uh, specifically Xerxes and his father Darius, worshipped the Lord Ahura Mazda, and yeah. the whole thing about Ahura Mazda is he is the little G god of truth. Uh, against the demons and against the lie, capital L lie, right. that spreads throughout the world, and it is the the duty of of all who follow Lord Mazda to um, drive out the the lie and replace it with the glorious light of truth. And if I remember correctly, there's even a bit where when Darius uh, dies, there is a sacred flame on Mm -hmm. a mountain that is very special to them in their history that was then extinguished. It was the flame of his reign. Mm. Um, So I believe that there's a lot of probable reference points where the Persian fire is what's in mind. It could mean the the fire of the Persian spread of empire, you know, like a blazing forest fire or something. You could you could do anything you want. It could also just be a a play on Greek fire, you know? Oh, a um, couple things come to mind since we have a little bit of extra time. First, your point about uh, a Christian worldview as a as a platform for evaluation. How do you look at? How do you teach history? How do you evaluate, evaluate history? How do you say these are the bad guys? These are the good guys? Or these guys got this right? These guys got this right? They were both wrong in this. How do you do that if you don't have an absolute standard? Mm. How do you, you how do you judge between the colonizers and the colonized if there are no absolutes? Hey, they're both doing what they want. And one side lost. What's the big deal? Mm. How how do you make judgments if you don't have a standard that stands outside and above all limited human standards? Uh, the other thing I appreciate is I've been a long term fan of the Persians because the Bible is. As you read through Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, mm. you can see that with with a couple slips here and there, by and large, the Persian Empire is given more than passable grades. Cyrus 
is the Lord's anointed, his shepherd, the man who will do all his pleasure, who even to rebuilding Jerusalem and telling, ordering the temple to be rebuilt. And his decree fun, uh, functions as the beginning of a second exodus for God's people out of, out of Babylon. Mm -hmm. Darius is, uh, at first tells, because he's misinformed, is, tells the, the, uh, Israelites, no, you can't be building stuff. You can't be building your city. And then the prophets come along and says, but you can build the temple. Get with it, guys. And when the next word comes to Darius, uh, he says, temple? Oh, that's completely different. Yeah, they, they should be building that. Furthermore, they should, uh, they should be offering sacrifices for me and my sons and praying for us so that God doesn't get angry. The God of heaven does not get angry with us. Mm which either means that he was moving toward faith in the true God or he was confusing her a Mazda with, with Yahweh. But, you know, monotheistic deity, at least there, there's an opening there. Uh, and in fact, he says, and you're, you guys who are complaining, you can take money out of your own treasury and give it to them to build this temple that you don't like. Ha! <laughs> and then we have Ahasuerus who marries Esther, and he's not above criticism in his personal and sexual morals. But in the end, he stands with Ezra and her people, and when he can't come up with a solution of his own, he says, uh, I'm making your, your, your older cousin here prime minister, and you two figure out how to save your people, and I'm with you. I just don't got a clue on this one. What we see from Scripture of the Greeks is mostly by prophecy. None of it's terribly optimistic. <laughs> the picture of Alexander is he will be a king who will do according to his will. Then he'll die really early, and his kingdom will be split. Okay, that was fast. Uh, and, you know, we run in eventually into Antiochus Epiphanes who defiles the temple and all that. The Bible doesn't really like the Greeks a whole lot, but it does have a soft spot for the Persians to a point. Uh, Daniel worked with another Darius, who may have been Cyrus. Esther marries an imp uh, the emperor, one of the emperors. Nehemiah is a cupbearer for one of them. Another one, or perhaps one of the same ones, favors Ezra's ministry. So, yeah. So what, what is the thing that we always side with the Greeks? Well, they were naturalists. They believed that you could get your morality just from nature. Now, the truth is, that's not at all what they believed. But that's what Renaissance and Enlightenment scholars managed to get out of it by ignoring what they were actually saying and saying, see, they're talking about reason and, and, and their reason coming up with laws and things and and it's all completely secular. No, it's not. Go back and read what the philosophers actually wrote. But that made Greece dear to the heart of every humanist for a while, until we found out that reason also has its problems. It somehow keeps pointing us back to God, and that's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so thank you. I will, uh, at some point, when I still, I'm still working on his book, Dominion. Oh, um, it's so excellent, though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I'm about halfway through and I got sidetracked. <laughs> so I need to get back to that so I can read this one now. Yeah. And that means that now I have to come up with a recommendation. I'm going to get really serious here for a second uh, as a, a Bible teacher and an elder. Uh, it's been this, these last couple of years have been really, really hard on the churches, on Christian individuals, on, on young Christian couples, people who just started out. Uh, and the enemy's been throwing all kinds of things at God's people. It's been very hard. My recommendation is something that is very serious, very personal, and so essential. And that's an ongoing personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Beyond studying theology and Christian philosophy and a Christian worldview and Christian principles for government and all that stuff, which most certainly has its place and we talk about all the time, when that becomes your Christianity, you may suddenly find out that your marriage and your personal life are falling to pieces. And your church, your pastors and elders may find out that the church is something wrong. There's something eating away with things. Why are so many young couples not making a go of their marriages all the way? As an elder, I know the first thing we ask is, so how is your devotional life? How's your prayer life? How's your reading of God's word? Why aren't you in church more often? And we get really lame answers. Uh, as if knowing a lot of theology can give you a ha good and happy life, let alone make you acceptable to God. Yes, by all means, read a book now and then on Christian history or Christian philosophy or Christian economics or Christian approach to art and all that. But above all, my friends, know Jesus. 
spend time in his word, make it a habit, make it a discipline, pray to him as one man talketh to his friend, and um, throw your heart and your life on him. Open open your, your heart's sorrows and hopes to him and talk to him and call for his mercies and make this a center focus of, of your home, your private life, your marriage, your business, and go to church. And don't drag your feet in getting there. <laughs> go with joy and flowers in your hair, as Dr. Schaefer would say, uh, and be excited about knowing and loving Jesus. So my recommendation for today. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for uh, this discussion and that recommendation in particular. An excellent reminder. Yeah. Scott. And uh, thank you to all of you for joining us as well. Uh, if you would like to follow us, you can do so on YouTube, through Rumble. You can follow our Facebook page, uh, which is currently not very active, but you can still go like <laughs> it. Uh, and if you want to subscribe to us and listen to us more, uh, you can do so through any podcast catcher. If you would like to email us, you can do so at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. We'd be happy to hear from you if uh, you have any questions for us or suggestions for a topic you'd like us to cover. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you to our financial supporters as well. And if you would like to join them, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. You really help make this show possible and we greatly appreciate all your help. And speaking of making the show possible, a thanks to David Maxson, our producer. We hope to see you next time. Have a blessed day.